And so they're continuing this path, and we're, and we're going to go into these different areas that they're going to hit. We're going to talk about what God is speaking through these things. So, um, before we get into that, the question I wanted to ask you yesterday, and in light of, of what, what we just prayed about for Iraq, what are some things that, that we as individuals, especially we as either Koreans or expat in Korea, what are things that we take for granted just living our normal lives? Context of Iraq, I would say religious freedom. <laughs> what else? What are some things that we take for granted on a on a daily basis? Smartphones. Smartphones. You know, like smartphones, you can do so many crazy things on, right? The funny thing is, a lot of like poor countries, people have smartphones. It's really weird. <laughs> I'm hearing all about like Africa, like they're they're going crazy with smartphones over there. I don't, I don't know how that works. Regardless, um, what else? What are some other things that we take for granted? Shower, okay, water, <laughs> running water, hygiene, right? I think most of you shower today. I hope all of you shower today. <laughs> what else? What else? Transportation. Transportation, right? Being able to get to and fro, um, especially in a large city like Seoul, right? Okay. What about something more basic? I'm trying to get to something very specific. Let's see if we can get there. Huh? Food, okay. Food is important. Without food, you'll probably die after a little while. <laughs> Water, okay. Hmm? Oxygen. I didn't, I didn't know there was an oxygen deficiency anywhere, but sure. <laughs> what about education? Right. That's something that, in, in, in many ways, in Korea, it's it's somewhat of an idol, right? It's something that 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 we focus a lot of our attention on. But just getting to education, what about the ability to read and write? Literacy, right? Korea is actually one of the higher percentages in the world. I think it's around 98%. Road average is around 86%, something like that. Um, Korea is among the highest in the world in, in literacy. Um, but, you know, think about how life would be if you couldn't read, right? If all you could do was speak, but you couldn't read and write. That would be a very different life, right? Forget about texting. <laughs> Forget about even being able to operate a smartphone, right? That life would be very different. Now, there's a reason why I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on this, because we're going to get to that in a second. But, but you know, I, I just want us to stay in the context of remembering that we have access to so many things, so many things that we take for granted. Now, with that, let's get to the passage. Acts 17, verses 1 to 15. Acts 17, verses 1 to 15. Go to your Bibles, open your smartphones, or look on the screen above. Cool. Acts 17 goes like this. When Paul and his companions had passed through uh, Epiphilus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has, has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying uh, Caesar's decree saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, 
But Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Amen. So as I said before, this is a detour. They had an original plan to go back to the churches that they had planted in the first missionary journey. They were just going to encourage the chur churches and lift them up. But now they're going into new areas that they weren't planning to. Right? Now last, last week we talked about how they were in Philippi, which is one of the major cities in that area. Now they're going to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was actually the capital city. So this was a big, major city. You saw in, Philipp uh, in Philippi there was no synagogue, so the Jewish population was very small there. Here, there is a synagogue, so there's a very large Jewish population. And Paul, whenever he goes to a new city, he goes first to the, to the synagogue because he wants to minister first to the Jews. And so you see that he does that for three weeks. Three weeks, he goes there every Sabbath. And he explains to them. And he proves to them. He basically argues with them and wins the argument saying that Jesus was the Messiah. And many are converted. Many are amazed. But then there are some that out of jealousy grow angry. And they, they get these, these lynch mobs together and they drive them out of the city. Right? That's what happened in Thessalonica. So you see them go into the city. It's received. Right? There's, a cycle, there's a cycle of reception and opposition. This has happened throughout all the missionary journeys. It's happening again. Initially, the gospel takes plant, but then opposition forms and forces them to leave. Right? Again, this continues. In Thessalonica. Now, then they go to Berea. They're going to Berea because they're running away from the persecution. Right? Berea is like this small podunk city, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. They're just hiding out. They're laying low in Berea. Now, Paul, like I said last week, he wants to minister wherever he is. If he's in jail, he's going to minister. If he's on the run, he's going to minister. So he ministers to Berea. But what the Bible says is that the Bereans were of more noble character. Why? Why were they of more noble character than the Thessalonians? Thessalonica was this big, you know, metropolitan city. These guys were the capital of the area. Berea is just kind of, you know, this, this podunk city in the middle of nowhere. But the Bible says specifically that they were of more noble character. Now... The Bereans, um, you'll often see churches that are called the Berean Church, or the Church of Berea. Um, even myself, the very first, one of the very first times I ever preached, I quoted from Acts 17, verse 11. And the reason why was because I challenged the people that I was just about to preach to, for the very first time, number one, this was like before I ever went to seminary, this is, I, I didn't know what I was doing at all, I was just working as an engineer at Motorola, and I was preaching. <laughs> and I was like, look, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> so because of that, you should be like a Berean. You should go back to the Word. And you should make sure anything that I say makes sense and is true before you accept it. That's the model of the Berean. Like the Seth Thessalonians, they received the Word. But the thing that they did differently from the Thessalonians was that they went back to the Bible and they verified and confirmed that it was truth that they were seeing. That's the big point of today. What does it mean to be a Berean? Right? To be a Berean is to be a man or a woman of the Word of God. To use the Word of God to confirm truth. And that way, when you receive truth, when you hear truth, you can discern what is right and what is wrong. And you can be like a Berean more noble character. Now, they use the Bible, they go back, and, and you know, it's a very short verse, right? 17 verse 11. But at the same time, this verse has inspired many pastors to name their church, the Berean Church, the Church of Berea, so on and so forth. There's a lot of churches like that all over the world. And it's because these people went back to confirm the truth. So how does this apply to us? Well, let me, let me give you a quick history lesson. Protestant Reformation. Right? Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther nails up these 95 treatises or theses, gets kicked out of the Catholic Church, starts his own church, basically. Um, and that's the start of, of really our tradition now today. This is a Presbyterian church. We're birthed out of that, that Protestant movement, right? The church that moved out of the, the Roman Catholic Church. 
Now, what was the whole point of the, the Protestant Reformation? Before the Protestant Reformation, if you wanted to read the Bible, you couldn't, unless you were a priest, right? Because the Bible was written in Latin, and by that point, no one spoke Latin anymore. Everyone calls Latin a dead language because it was dead. <laughs> no one spoke Latin anymore. People like to speak pig Latin, which I think is the most ridiculous thing in the world. Um, but, but no one spoke Latin anymore. So they were using this old ancient language that no one could read except for the priests. And so because of that, if you were a, a, a faithful churchgoer, all you could do was go to church. You couldn't, you, you, number one, you didn't have your own Bible because Bibles were extremely expensive. Most of them were handwritten. And even when the Gutenberg press, you know, Gutenberg, uh, you know, the, the, the printing press comes out, it's still expensive, right? Still took like a year's salary to, to buy one of those things. So very few people had the Bible, and even if they had the Bible, it was written in some other language that they didn't know. So think about that. What if you came to church today, and I read the Bible from you, but I was, I was reading from Latin, right? Or Greek, or Hebrew, or whatever it was. And you're just like, uh, okay. Sounds, sounds biblical, <laughs> right? And then I come up, and then finally I'm speaking in your language. So I'm speaking in English in the service, and I'm explaining to you what I had just read, right? You have no way to check if what I was saying was true, because you couldn't read the Bible on your own. That was what the church was like before Luther started the Protestant Reformation. The Bible was stuck in only the hands of the priests. So the majority of people could not read the Bible on their own. It was kept away from them. So what the Protestant Reformation really did was that it brought the Bible back to the people. One of the first things that, that Martin Luther did was he, he translated the Bible into German, which was the common language in his country. Right? He, he translated it into the vernacular. That was why the, church, the Protestant church left, was so the Bible could be freed to the people once more. You can't be a brain if you don't have a Bible, or you don't have a Bible you can't understand. Right? Now, go back to the early Korean church. Now, I, I've talked a lot about Korean church history, but just to give you a very quick refresh. One of the first things the missionary did, missionaries did when they came into Korea was they spent a lot of time translating the Bible into Hangul. Now, if you know your Korean history, Hangul had been around for you know hundreds of years. You know, People always talk about King Sejong. King Sejong did like everything in Korea. He's like, he's like a man. Right? He's, all, he's all the money and everything. He's like, oh, King Sejong. Um, but, but the thing with, with Hangul was that for 400 years, no one used it as a written language. People spoke it, right? But they didn't use it as a written language because the, the, the main like, education language at the time was Chinese. And the, part of the reason why they didn't like the, the you know, Hangul alphabet was because it was too easy. You know, Korea, like, there, there, were, there were people that would say, uh, like this is this is this is uh, too simple of a language because a woman can understand. Like we don't want to use this. And so for 400 years, Sejong makes this alphabet, which is like world renowned, right? The, the the thing with the Korean alphabet is that scholars all around the world proclaim it to be one of the easiest alphabets to pick up. Actually, for for someone who's never studied Korean before, you can pick up the Korean alphabet in like a day. It's that easy. Now, the language itself is different. <laughs> I'm still working on that. <laughs> but the alphabet itself, very simple, right? And it was not used for 400 years because the intellectual elite, the Yangban, wanted a difficult language because they wanted a language that other people couldn't understand. Just like the Roman Catholic Church wanted Latin to be the, the language that the priests used so that no one else could understand. <laughs> But what the missionaries did, the American missionaries, when they came to Korea, one of the first things they did was they translated the Bible not into Chinese, which is what the Yangban would have accepted, they translated it into Hangul. Not only did they translate the Bible into Hangul, they also started writing a lot of like Christian articles and, and, and publications in Hangul. And basically, a lot of Korean scholars have actually basically credited the, the missionaries for saving Hangul as a written form of language, right? So without the missionaries, there's a good chance we could have lost the Hangul alphabet, especially when Japan came in right away and tried to get rid of, you know, anything that wasn't Japanese. 
very interesting, our history here in Korea. But because the Bible was translated into, Bible, into Korean so early, that actually gave the Korean church a way to govern itself, a way to, to have a, a basis and understanding of what church and Christianity meant. One of the things that the American missionaries did was they didn't let the, the Korean church become dependent upon the American uh, sending churches. They actually made the Korean Presbyterian church independent as early as like 1907, something like that. So almost from the very beginning, the Korean church was independent. And almost from the very beginning, the Korean church had its own Bible. So it had its own way of learning how to be a church and how to build itself up. And so the main thing that the Korean church is focused on back in the day was Bible study. They wanted to know more about the Bible so they could know how to run a church, how to be Christian. Now I know growing up as a kid, I used to think the Korean Bible was stupid. Because, I, I, you know, whenever I would read the Korean Bible, well, I, I couldn't read it that well, but whenever I would hear things from the Korean Bible, it sounded silly, right? You know, I was like, why are they saying Isaac's name, Isaac? That doesn't make any sense. Stupid Koreans. What's wrong with their pronunciation? And I carried this with me for many years. And then I actually went to seminary, I started studying Hebrew and Greek, and I was like, oh, Isaac's how you're supposed to say it. <laughs> I'm the dummy. Because <laughs> the, the, the guys that translated the Bible into Korean, they were very like pure biblicists. So they were using the original Greek, the original Hebrew, and translating that directly into Korean. So that's why they have like, it's kind of confusing, honestly. When you go to the Korean Bible and like you say a book of the Bible, you're like, what? Because it's like, completely different from English sometimes. So I get confused going to the Korean church. I'm like, what passage are they talking about? And I have to like go to my table of contents. I'm like, oh, numbers. <laughs> What's numbers in Korean again? Minsuki. What, what is that? <laughs> anyway, um, so, so the thing is, part of the reason why the Korean church built up so fast early was because it had independence and it had its own power. So the reason I was talking so much about literacy in the beginning, is brothers and sisters, we have a Bible. We have the ability to read and write, right? And like the Bereans, we can be like them. We can go back to the Word. We can verify that what is preached to us is truth, rather than just receiving and accepting without any type of accountability. I actually encourage you guys, to make sure that what I'm saying lines up with the Bible. I'm, I'm a little worried. I'm going to get a bunch of emails. <laughs> you said this. Um, I'm a little worried about that. But, but regardless, I encourage you guys. Confirm that you are receiving truth. Go back to the Word. Know your Word, honestly. So, so really, for us, you know, I, I want us to be a, a community. I want us to be a church that loves the Word of God. You know, we did Bible study, um, you know, last semester and the semester before. We, we, we went through a study on Christ in the Old Testament. Um, I actually still need to finish that study because Daniel was the only one who was there for the last study. <laughs> but, but regardless, you know, we went through Christ in the Old Testament and... and for me, like, I, I'd kind of forgotten how awesome that study is. Because what Christ in the Old Testament really does is, it, it shows you that the story of Christ was there from the very beginning. And it puts, you know, all these stories in Genesis, it puts Moses, uh, King David, all these things in the context of, of, of the coming Savior, coming Christ. And it blows your mind. Um, I forgot about that, because, you know, I, I was just teaching it, and then I'm just seeing people like, whoa, that's crazy. Like, the, like, just seeing how the Bible is interwoven, right? That this book that was written over a period of like 4,000 years with, with a bunch of different authors actually has an amazing continuity that couldn't have been conspired by a couple of dudes, right? It's the hand of God. And to see that in a greater context, man, blows your mind. And so, brothers and sisters, we're going to start a new season of Bible study in September, um, I actually haven't decided what we're going to study yet, but I do encourage you guys to check that out. To really become just literate in your word, um, and, and to really know it in such a way that you would see that there is power in the word of God. 
Now, when I was in high school, um, if any of you are familiar with navigators, they have this thing called the TMS pack, Topical Memory System. It's like 60 verses. Uh, one of my youth group teachers was really big on, on, on it because he was from navigators. He would give us his T TMS pack and he would challenge us to memorize the whole thing, 60 verses, right, with the title and everything. Um, and he would like, all he would do was say, I'll get you a Big Mac from McDonald's. And we're like, oh yeah. <laughs> we're like studying our you know, brains out for like this $3, you know, actually back then it was probably like $2, <laughs> like, you know, Big Mac, and, and, and we're going crazy about it. But I remember him telling us a story about how when he was in Navigators and when he was studying the, this TMS pack, one time he was with a friend of his who wasn't a believer. And he didn't know what to say. And so all he did was he recited the TMS pack, all 60 verses in front of her. It took him probably like five minutes. But she actually got saved through it. It's like amazing. But the, the reason why is because the, the TMS pack, it builds a story, right? It takes 60 verses and it, and it takes you through like, you know, where you are as a human, what God has done. It's basically revealing the gospel in 60 verses. Very interesting format. But he told us, all he did was recite it from memory, and his friend was saved. And I was like, wow, there's power in the Word. There's power in knowing your Word. So brothers and sisters, I encourage us to be a church, a community that loves the Bible, that studies it, that cherishes, and yearns for more time to study it. So we are going to start that up again. We'll have... I'm still trying to figure out how we're going to do our after-service studies, just because our schedule is a little bit complicated. Um, but that will start soon. But for sure, we'll have our Friday Bible studies starting up in a couple weeks. So I encourage you guys to make time for that if you can. And to really know that, that there is power in the Word of God. Be a brave. <laughs> a person of more noble character not a Thessalonian, like a Thessalonian, like that's a low, that's a icon. Sorry, that's a icon. Don't be a Thessalonian that that gets jealous, that gets distracted, and focuses on the wrong things. But be a Brian, because honestly, some of the Brians probably thought what Paul was saying was weird. When Paul was speaking to them, he's like, "Wait a minute, like, I don't agree with some of these." But he, they went back to the word. And they said, wow, what he was saying was true. And then they believed. Not everyone accepted him from the beginning, but they went back to the Word and saw that what he was speaking was true. So brothers and sisters, very simple message today. Be a brain, which really means to be a man and a woman of the Word of God. Let's take a moment to pray, and then we'll close our service today. I just want you to take a moment to pray that, that God would illumine the Word in a way that, that He would speak to you through it. That, that, it. that when you do spend time in the Word, it wouldn't just be a routine action, something that, that you're doing just to check it off the list, but that it would actually be an interactive experience. That you would actually encounter God when you go to the Word. So I just want us to pray that, that God would, would start to illumine the Word to us in that way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us your very words that we would know more about you. That we wouldn't be, Lord, people of ignorance, but that there would be a standard to what we know to be truth. So we thank you for giving us this wonderful gift and pray, Lord, that like the Bereans, that we will continue to look back to your word that when you speak truth to us, Lord, that, that it wouldn't just, just, just pass through us, Lord, but that we would hold on to it, that we would confirm it, and that we would be a challenge to grow through that, Lord.
We thank you, Lord. We praise your name, Jesus. Amen.